Which way do you will you prefer to stay with you have to put a camera who said up will you stay here here or outside you can stay outside okay fine that camera is working hello okay um just would like to um say hello to everyone here as well as to people in the zoom uh just Give us a few minutes. We are just working out some of the uh, technical part uh, and we'll be ready for with the colloquium soon. You guys can also populate seats here as Vaibhav well will. <laughs> Are we ready? Full screen nahi ho raha hai. Full screen ka hai. Full screen nahi dikh raha hai. Full screen. This is this is what we'll get. This is what I fear we'll get. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can everybody in the Zoom see the screen? Just um, mention in the chat box that the screen is visible. Yes, screen is visible. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, we are pretty much uh, ready now. So I welcome everyone uh, for this uh, special edition of the NSF Wednesday Colloquium. It's actually a welcome colloquium. It's a welcome from TIFR to our new director, uh, Professor Jairam um, Changular. Um, so uh, we actually uh, would um, uh, like to uh, uh, sort of specifically uh, give him the opportunity and the floor to um, uh, present some of the work that he has been involved in. But before we can do that, let me... Uh, uh, let me introduce um, uh, Jairam to the audience. So, um, Professor Chengul, uh, Cheng, uh, Chengalur actually went to do his undergrad uh, from IIT Kanpur. Um, and this was in 1987 where he finished his undergraduate in electrical engineering as a uh, you know, Bachelor of Technology BTEC. He completed his uh, coursework in 1987, post which he switched completely from electrical engineering to astronomy. And he did his PhD from Cornell University, which he finished in 1994, um, uh, and sort of set foot in this area forever until this point. Um, after his PhD from Cornell, he moved to his two years postdoc uh, from the Netherlands Foundation of Research and Astronomy. Um, after which he returned back to India to take up a position in NCRA, which is uh, one of the, the biggest institutes in the country uh, for radio astronomy, as well as in, in one of the very important institutes in the world. Um, he has been there um, uh, ever since uh, as a distinguished professor, and um, it was only um, recently in July of this year, he was appointed as the TIFR director and he moved in to the campus with all of us and he has been here for the last few months. 
and this is basically a, a, a welcome for him. So, uh, uh, Jaram, so welcome, and please, uh, uh, you know, you, you can take the floor and present the colloquy. I'm sorry for the mispronunciation of your last name. The <laughs> yeah, no, that's All okay. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. So then, without. Uh, Yeah, so then, you know, without further ado, let me get started. I'm going to talk um, about the evolution of atomic, of the atomic gas content in galaxies. And, you know, if uh, all of this is gobbledygook to you, don't worry, I'll sort of uh, spell it out as we go along. Uh, but before I even start spelling it out, I'd like to acknowledge uh, these people particularly, um, you know, who've really done all of the heavy lifting on this project. Uh, there's Apurba Bera and Aditya Chaudhary who have worked on it for their PhD thesis and have really done an, uh, you know, an, uh, an amazing job on it. And Nisim Kanekar, who's been the driving force, I would say, behind uh, pretty much all of what I'm going to talk about. All right, so let me just start by, uh, you know, reminding you of things which you probably know, but I'd just like uh, to keep it, uh, you know, front and center as we go along. So, you know, please uh, forgive me if you know this stuff. Um, uh, you know, light has a finite speed, of course. So that means that when we look at celestial objects and we observe a celestial object, we don't see it as it is now. We see it as it was at the time the light was emitted. So as you probably all learned in school, we see the sun as it was a few minutes ago. I just I just thought, you know, rather than spend time on it, if people can do that, I'll just move ahead. Yeah. Yes, so that I can do it. Yeah. And hide the properties. Yeah, just that, good the cross here. Yeah. Yeah. And high and then yeah, high current. High floating controls. Yes. Yeah. High video. No, floating no, 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 controls. I can't see it here. Yeah, I think it goes after a little while, right? By itself, it goes down. Yeah, it should go. Okay. So yeah. No? You can drag it and put it on top. No. Drag it on top. So how do I get out of this? No, that did not help. More, more. Okay, fine. Yes. Yeah, it's all good. I the video panel is not going to help, right? That's what the PC. Okay, so I, I'll, I'll just open it now. Is this okay, or we should go to full screen? So the problem, the problem I realized is when you're in full screen, the text is getting cut, right? Okay. By this bottom panel. Yes. Shift that right? Okay. okay. Yeah, as best as we can. Yeah, sorry about that. But uh, I guess these are the problems when you try and marry a, a projector with Zoom. But anyway, um, so uh, so the sun we see as it was a few minutes ago, the nearest star we see when we look at it, what we actually see is the star as it was a few years ago. And the kind of distant galaxies that you can observe uh, these days, uh, we, you know, with a reasonable telescope, you see it as it was the most distant galaxies that you could see. You see it as it were several giga years ago. And so that basically means, even though you're observing here on the Earth, you can actually see uh, galaxies at different epochs, and that allows you to study the evolution, the time evolution of galaxies. The other thing I wanted to remind people is because the universe is, and this just, you know, to catch you up to the jargon that I'll just be using, that because the universe expands, uh, the light from distant objects is observed at longer wavelengths than the wavelength at emission. So if a galaxy uh, was emitting bluish light, um, by the time you observe it, it would look reddish. And so uh, that quantifies how much the universe has expanded between the time that the galaxy emitted the light and you observed it. And so that's quantified uh, in terms of uh, this, which is called the redshift, which is the ratio of the wavelength which you observe versus the wavelength which was emitted minus one. 
So the redshift basically quantifies both the distance and the look back time. So I'll go on using redshift and you can think of it either as the distance or the look back time. And um, you know, the, you know, the, the relationship between the redshift and the distance or the look back time depends on the cosmology. That is, uh, you know, the rate at which the universe has been expanding. And throughout pretty much I'll use what, you know, is often called the 737 cosmology, which is that you take a Hubble constant of 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. 30% uh, of uh, stuff is in matter, 70% is in dark energy. And uh, it's close enough uh, to uh, you know what we currently believe, and it you know, and uh, if you want to put in the latest numbers, it's easy to scale from this. Jenna, can yeah. I ask a quick question? Yeah, the stupid one. Um, how do I distinguish which photons we are detecting and where it is coming from? From the wavelength. I mean, we typically we are looking at a spectral line. We are looking at a spectral line. We know what line it is. It's a line of hydrogen, calcium, whatever or the other. I know it's lab wavelength, and so I can compute uh, what you know what the redshift is. I and mean, it works for lines, for a spectral line for which we know what the rest wavelength is. All right, um, so what are galaxies? Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the evolution of hydrogen in galaxies. So what are galaxies uh, made of? Uh, typically, when you say galaxy to people, they think of a collection of stars, which is correct, of course. But a galaxy has many other constituents. Uh, most importantly, it has this thing called dark matter in it, which um, uh, uh, doesn't, uh, uh, can't be observed at any electromagnetic wavelength, uh, but its gravity can be inferred, and so that's why it's called dark matter. And it dominates, it's the most dominant mass-wise component of the galaxy, it dominates over the normal matter, the baryonic matter. And uh, in addition to the stars and the dark matter, there is what you call the interstellar medium, uh, or the ISM, which primarily consists of atomic hydrogen or molecular hydrogen. Hydrogen, of course, being the most element, most abundant element in the universe. In addition, there are all these trace uh, kind of uh, things in the galaxy. And all of these constituents actually play an important role in the, an active and important role in the evolution of a galaxy. So I'm just showing you over here, uh, a picture of two, three galaxies actually, which are nearby. Uh, the, what you see in black is the starlight. What you see in red is uh, uh, an image of the galaxy made in atomic hydrogen with the GMRT. And you can see that, um, you know, the galaxy actually looks quite different uh, in these two different traces. The, the optical stars are mostly in the center of the galaxy. The hydrogen is distributed much further out. So even if you want to understand what a galaxy is, let alone what the evolution of a galaxy is, you need to start looking at all of these different constituents of a galaxy. All right. Um, so, um, you know, talk, how do these galaxies form? Uh, so uh, they form basically out of gravitational instabilities. If you look at the very early universe, so for this is a map of the cosmic microwave background, which is uh, at redshifts of the about a thousand. At that time, you can measure that the universe was not actually perfectly uh, homogeneous. There was density fluctuations of the order of one part in 10 to the five, and these grow by gravitational instability. Basically, where the parts which are denser, they have a deeper gravitational well, so nearby material will fall into it, and so it becomes still denser, and it becomes a runaway process. Right? And that's the way in which all of the galaxies that we see around us today is believed to have formed. Uh, the, and all of this is driven primarily by the gravity of the dark matter because that's the dominant matter. Uh, the galaxies themselves are not homogeneously distributed in the universe. They are arranged in larger structures, walls, uh, two-dimensional wall, two walls, filaments, uh, one-dimensional filaments, clusters, which are typically uh, at the intersection of filaments and so on. So that's, I'm just showing you a distribution of galaxies in the nearby universe, and you can see uh, that it does have this kind of very networked uh, filamentary kind of distribution. All right, and now how do individual galaxies form? Um, um, Overdense regions uh, collapse and we realize to what we call dark matter halos, and the baryons cool and collect at the center of this dark matter potential, and the cool gas collapses to form stars. So that's, you know, to zero order what happens. 
The galaxies, of course, don't form at one instant. Uh, they grow and evolve over time. And there are two major processes which are important, one of which is hierarchical merger. Small objects go on merging to form bigger ones. And I'm just showing you a hierarchical merger tree over here, where the dark matter halos go on uh, uh, sort of uh, merging to form bigger and bigger dark matter halos and bigger and bigger galaxies. And in addition to that, there's also gas secretion onto the halo. And that, again, the two major uh, uh, mechanisms by which it happens. The the gas falls in at a, you know, and gets shock heated and gets hot. It forms a hot corona around the galaxy, which then gradually cools and collapses. Or the galaxy uh, gets gas in the form of a cold flow, uh, which flows along the filaments in the large scale structure typically and feeds the growth of galaxy. And that then just penetrates deep down into the galaxy and sort of feeds the growth right at the center. And uh, cold flows are known to be the dominant mode of gas secretion for galaxies, which are less massive, with masses of less than about three times 10 to the 11 solar masses. All right, so now uh, that was, you know, our theoretical ideas of how uh, galaxies form, how large scale structure forms. But in addition, you can ask the question observationally, what do I know about the way in which galaxies form and evolve? And much of what that is learned from optical observations. And I'm going to show you some of these um, sort of uh, things that we know about star formation and the growth of galaxies from the optical surveys, right? And so these are typically what are called scaling relations or, um, you know, the, in, 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 in galaxies. And one important scaling relation is the following, that if you uh, sort of look at the stellar mass of the galaxy and the rate at which it's forming stars, the two are actually correlated. And I'm showing that in this plot over here, where there's the log of uh, the star formation rate, that is the mass of stars being formed per year, as a function of the mass of the galaxy. And you can see the bulk of the galaxies actually lie are scattered around the line like this, right, uh, in this log log plot. Uh, so this, um, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I just wanted to mention, uh, because I'm going to make a big deal about it later, that the optical surveys tell you a lot about the stars, but it actually tells you uh, almost nothing about the gas content of the galaxy. So all of this is just stellar properties, the star formation rate and the mass of the galaxies. Right, so uh, most of those uh, galaxies which are forming stars actually form uh, lie in this sort of along that line uh, in this plot, and that's called the main sequence of galaxies. And the bulk of the star formation in galaxies forms along the main sequence. How do you define this mass of the galaxies? Mass of the stars in the galaxies, not the mass of the galaxy as a whole, just the mass of the stars in the galaxy, stellar mass of the galaxy. Uh, the total mass you would have to measure by dynamical means or something, but uh, you know you 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 measure the rotation of some object around uh, dust mass around the galaxy or something. You model it and you get the total mass. But this is just the mass in stars. So it's just it's just properties of the stars in a galaxy. Yeah. We have talked about a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that you can get from kinematics of the galaxy. Yeah, but here we are talking only about the stellar properties of the galaxy. And the optical measures give you the star formation rate. The optical measurements, yeah, typically what you do is you measure uh, the brightness in a multiple uh, number of photometric bands, and by modeling it appropriately, you can derive quantities like the stellar mass and the star formation rate. Yeah, the rate that, which is literally the number, number of solar masses per year that's being formed. Yeah. How do you even measure the mass of the stars in a distant galaxy? Because it's probably not so resolvable, right? The yeah, you measure it by photometry. By the brightness, of, it's a it's basically a mapping between the luminosity in different bands. Which uh, I mean, so it's called spectral energy density fitting, which uh, which basically allows you to uh, you fit a model to the brightness in different optical bands, and that. Brightness will depend on things like the star formation rate and the mass of the stellar mass in the galaxy. The mass to brightness relationship is well established and not questioned. Um, yeah, well, yeah. So this thing is called SCD fitting. And uh, yeah, there are different models of, uh, you know, there are different SCD models that people could fit. They are broadly in agreement, but they are not. I mean, I think that's there is definitely a, a scatter between models, but. You know, to zeroth order, this is correct. I believe the order is scatters of about 0.3 dex in stellar mass, but uh, I could be wrong between models. There's one more question there. So, photometry doesn't mean uh, Lyman series or Bowman series? Of no, this is continuum. So, a uh, broadband photometry of galaxies. Is there any specific band that is used, uh, for example, 
um, yeah, so I mean, yeah, so for example, um, you know, if you wanted to measure uh, the stellar mass, typically you would measure the, the bands which are most sensitive to stellar mass are the, are, the, are the long wavelength bands, because much of the mass in the galaxies, it's in the older stars, which are more reddish in color, and these are also less affected by dust, these bands. If you want to measure the star formation rate, typically it's, measure, you know, more, uh, the, the bands which are more sensitive to it are bands which are closer to the UV because it's the hot bright stars which emit a lot of UV and so the amount of UV that you get is typically proportional to the number of stars which have formed over the last 100 million years or so. So but once you have a whole bunch of bands you can actually fit models to it and work out all these parameters. Less amount of dust means less amount of scattering. Less, no, dust basically just attenuates your measurement and unless you correct for it, uh, you, 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 you know, your measurement will be wrong. Yeah, so the, uh, the bulk of the star formation in the universe happens in these galaxies which lie along the main sequence. The other thing that uh, has been well established is that this main sequence of galaxy formation evolves with redshift. So, uh, for example, the amplitude increases with redshift. I have shown you uh, the, the main sequence at two redshift ranges, one between redshifts of 0.2 and 0.45, and the other one between 0.85 and 1. And um, it typically increases by a factor of almost an order of magnitude between a redshift of zero and one. The slope also changes slightly, but the main uh, thing that happens is that uh, the, uh, the amplitude uh, of, of the main sequence increases. That means a star, uh, a galaxy of a given mass, so 10 to the 11 solar masses, would be forming stars at a rate which is almost 10 times higher at a redshift of one than a similar galaxy at a redshift of zero. Okay, um, so that was what happens in uh, in galaxies. If I look at the star formation rate of galaxies, I could also ask a kind of averaged question that I take a typical volume of the universe and I ask the question what happens to the star formation rate in a typical volume of the universe over, over time, right? And so that is like the cosmic uh, star formation history uh, or the star, star formation rate density of the universe. And so what's plotted on the vertical axis is the amount of mass, uh, stellar mass that's being formed per unit time, per unit volume of the universe, uh, per unit volume being per megaparsec cube, as a function of look back time or redshift over here. And uh, so this again, uh, are measurements which have been, uh, you know, uh, quite well established by now. And what you see is that the average star formation rate per unit volume of the universe evolves quite strongly with redshift. There's a broad peak between redshifts of about one and three, and a steep decline at lower and higher redshifts. And about half of the total stellar mass that you see in galaxies today uh, are at redshifts between about one and three. And so this is sometimes called the epoch of galaxy assembly or the, or the cosmic noon. All right, so, um, you know, and I think this is probably the last bit of sort of background stuff I have, but I don't promise. Um, so, um, you know, in detail, um, you know, how, how, I mean, not quite in detail, but, you know, sort of uh, in a slightly more detail, how do stars form? Broadly speaking, galaxies have atomic gas, which is H1. It cools to form molecular gas. The molecular gas clouds cool further. They fragment, collapse into stars via gravitational instability. But the process is actually quite complicated because the, once you form stars, the stars uh, in, inject energy back into the interstellar medium, uh, both in the form of stellar winds or when they explode as supernovae, or there might be black holes, which again feed um, energy back into the interstellar medium and sort of either ionize the clouds or disperse the clouds or whatever. So this process is complicated, but Fundamentally, this is what happens when you want to form stars. You take atomic gas, you cool it to form molecular gas, it fragments to form fragments of clouds, and those form stars. And so, and yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, not at all. Yeah. In the yeah. previous case, you have shown that this redshift and star formation, they are somehow linked to each other. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the link, I mean, the, I mean the redshift is like an independent parameter, it's just time. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, the rate at which uh, stars are being formed in the universe is not steady over time, but it's evolving uh, quite strongly. At very early times in the universe, there was very little star formation. Yeah. At sort of, uh, you know, at look back times of the order of 10 billion years is when the bulk of the stars formed. After that, the star formation rates declining. 
And so, uh, you know, if I look at galaxies and ask when did they form most of their stars, most of the stars in galaxies formed around this epoch. Okay, so my uh, concern was that, I mean, uh, uh, redshift means that it is linked to the expansion of the universe. Yes. Star formation is a uh, so, scenario yeah. which is uh, different. Yeah. Is it, I mean, these two could be linked together. Yeah, yeah. so that's what I was trying to say. That that's just, 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 just time, just think of it as time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, can you tell me what is yeah. H1? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I, I should have introduced that jargon a long time ago. Uh, uh, atomic hydrogen uh, astronomers tend to call H1. And uh, uh, molecular hydrogen, they tend to call H2. Yeah. <laughs> to call. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are other things which are called H2, but okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. H two, yes. Plus is also called H two. Yeah. So okay. Okay. Fine. Yeah. It's it's linked to the fact that the universe is expanding, and because of that, uh, the redshift the links to both distance and to time. Yeah. So redshift is basically a way of parameterizing either the distance to the object or the look back time to the objects. So that's what I was explaining, that when I look at the sun, I see it as it was eight minutes ago because it's that far away and so on and so forth. So uh, if I look at a galaxy at a very distant redshift, I'm actually seeing it as it was in the distant past. So it's sort of telling me about the universe or that galaxy at that epoch. Yeah? Again yes, yes, yes. Uh, there are some ideas, but uh, that, in a sense, is what my talk is about. <laughs> you know, about our, our, our contribution to some part of this graph. But yes, so, but basically what is happening over here is, is literally, I mean, you know, the, the stuff that I was talking about, you have to ask the question, what is the rate at which the mergers and the, the uh, mergers of objects in the universe is evolving? What is the rate at which the gas secretion onto galaxies is evolving? And all of that is what will drive this evolution. Because the processes which lead to the formation of galaxies and the evolution of galaxies, which is a hierarchical merger. You have to ask the question, how does the hierarchical merger of objects evolve? You have to ask the question, how does the accretion of matter onto galaxies evolve? And those two things are presumably what will link you to this diagram. So there must be some model in the diagram. There are, there are. There are people who will definitely. This is not a model. Yeah, this is uh, there are multiple fits, uh, okay. possible parametric fits you will give. But this is the fit that these people prefer. I'll later show you something more basic uh, uh, to that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Sorry, but um, yeah. So, uh, so the takeaway I wanted to 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 from the slide was that a full understanding of the star formation and basically the evolution of galaxies requires you to observe the cold gas components, not just the stars. You need to know what's happening to the H two. You need to know what's happening to the H one. That is the molecular hydrogen and the atomic hydrogen. And uh, in particular, what we will be talking about is the atomic hydrogen. That's what we observe with the JMRT, and that's also you know particularly interesting because it's the primary fuel out of which all of this process is going to happen. All right, but what do we know about the molecular hydrogen? So the molecular hydrogen uh, can be traced by looking at either CO in emission or dust in emission. H2 is the molecule that you're interested in, but H2 is a symmetric molecule, so it hardly uh, emits any electromagnetic radiation. So you have to look at trace molecules like CO uh, in order to try and figure out where is this molecular gas, or you can look at dust, which is also associated with molecular gas, and from that try and infer how much H2 you have. So both of these approaches have been taken. CO surveys typically have limited sampling. They're expensive observations, which take a long time. Dust emission can be done more quickly, and so you have large samples, but the conversion from dust to molecular gas is to be even more indirect than it is for CO. But, you know, nonetheless, yeah. You know, this, yeah. this is what? What does the what is the dust made of? You know, when you think of dust, we see yeah. like solid matter, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm not I'm not I'm not a great expert on this. So I think it's basically carbon and silicon, uh, small particles of carbon and silicon, which is primarily what we call dust. Yeah. And what is yeah. this survey that you are doing here for the CO uh, survey? What does that entail? What does that mean? Uh, so it is surveys for looking for emission from the CO molecule. So this is not work I have done. It's work that these people uh, and others have done. Yeah. 
Just the emission from CO. Just the emission from CO, and we're going to use the emission from CO to try and uh, uh, as a tracer for the amount of hydrogen, molecular hydrogen that's there in the galaxy, because CO is typically associated with H2. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so yes, as, uh, uh, that's basically what you do. You assume there is a ratio between your CO emissivity, the luminosity in CO, and the amount of H2 there is. But in detail, actually, that number is um, subject to a lot of argument. Uh, but yes, I mean, there's some kind of consensus as what a typical number should be that varies depending on the properties of the galaxies such as, um, you know, how much, uh, what we call metals, how, uh, how evolved the galaxy is, how enriched it is in material other than uh, uh, hydrogen and helium and so on and so forth. But yes, the idea is that you, you, somebody gives you a number and it says this is the scaling between CO and H2. There's one more question. Later. Yeah. Uh, this star formation rate, are yeah. we looking at numbers per some time or is it mass of stars formation? Mass per, per mass per time. Mass per that's time, not per time. No, that's typically what uh, it's parameterized as mass per time. Yeah. No, I think, oh, this So you don't, uh, you don't subscribe to the fact that the dust in the, you know, can be organic uh, like Vikram Basinthi. No, it could be, but it's not. Uh, I mean, it's not uh, terribly relevant to this. I mean, this dust that we're talking about, I think, is not organic. Yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, you know, so there are indirect measurements uh, of the molecular gas, but nonetheless, you know, uh, that's the best we can do. And people have uh, quite good, you know, spent a lot of time trying to make them as accurate and as reliable as possible. And uh, so what you, they have is the following. Uh, so, the, you know, these solid lines are all sort of fits to the data. So maybe we could just pay attention to the points with crosses, which comes from dust, and these bigger boxes, which come from CO uh, measurements. So what has been shown over here is the um, uh, amount of molecular gas per unit volume of the universe as a function of redshift or as a function of time, or, or, you know, look back time as a function of the age of the universe. And you can see that again, you know, um, there, there seems to be some indication that it's evolving in a similar way that the star formation rate was evolving. That there's a broad peak uh, somewhere at the rate shifts of about uh, 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 one to three. This is in log of one plus z, just uh, to make things interesting. So, um, but yeah, there's a really follows actually the evolution of the star formation rate of the galaxy. And in fact, uh, many of the you know simple lines that have been put over here have been drawn using this really basic assumption that the gas depletes at a constant rate. That is, if I have a certain uh, mass of H2, uh, a certain uh, mass in the molecular gas, and I know the rate at which stars are being formed, I divide the mass available by the rate at which it's being converted into stars, that gives me what is called a depletion time, right? Um, in detail, of course, there are many more uh, caveats over there, but this uh, basically in this subfield is uh, the parameter that people use to compare uh, different samples and so on and so forth and different, uh, uh, anyway. So uh, this thing, which is called the depletion time, the mass divided by the star formation rate. Uh, so if you just assume that this depletion time is constant, that the stars are being, uh, the molecular gas is being converted into stars, at a roughly constant rate, um, a depletion time of the order of about 0.5 to 1 giga year, that the depletion time doesn't change uh, very much uh, with the uh, evolution of the universe, you can match this curve. Uh, you can, uh, that basically you take the star formation rate, which you had measured here, you take the star formation rate, which you have measured here, you say you have a depletion time of about a giga year or a half giga year, and so from that, you can directly compute how much molecular gas you have because you need as much mass as can be converted into uh, stars in a, in a giga year. And uh, that gives you this curve that so they have the plotted over here. time has yeah. not changed yeah. over look back time, yeah. then uh, why there was an epoch of... Because the amount of uh, the material available was, uh, was evolving with time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. You have no molecular gas at that intermediate epoch. Right. Yeah. So the the gas clouds form the stars. So at what densities can we start to say that they are forming a stars? I mean, at 
how much close or like what densities can we say to I mean to define that they are they have formed as stars. So a star is not defined at the density. A star would be defined at the point at which nuclear fusion starts taking place at the center. So this is actually a hierarchical fragmentation process. The, the molecular gas cloud goes on uh, fragmenting, and it as it co collapses because of uh, virial heating, it gets hotter and hotter at the center. Finally, it will get hot enough that nuclear fusion will start. That's the point at which you call it a star. Okay, so can we like uh, yeah. frame it within terms of some internuclear separations or like interatomic and molecular separations? I mean, the clouds are there, so now... Yeah, so they, these are different objects, literally. I mean, there is, there is a cold cloud of gas which goes on fragmenting. The small fragments as they collapse heat up until finally in some fragment, the cent at the center, it's hot enough to, 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 to burn. Uh, nuclear uh, fuel and the density may not be the right parameter because that temperature varies depending on the mass of the object and so on. The density and the temperature will all vary depending on the mass of the object. So, Thank yeah. you. anyway, uh, to complete our understanding, this is the thing I wanted to say. If we, you know, okay, fine, we have some idea of what happens to the molecular gas. We would like to understand how the atomic gas in all these objects also evolve, and that's finally where we come in. Right? We observe the atomic gas in galaxies, and so that completes the picture. Uh, how do we observe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. no, that's all right. Yeah. Uh, you said yeah. that the galaxy formation is, is primarily driven by atomic. Uh, that, that's the, that is that is the that is the basic reservoir for for the star formation. Yeah, and the molecular is a small fraction. I'll talk about those things, but uh, the molecular um, in this idea would be an intermediate phase. You have the atomic gas, which is the basic reservoir. It comes to form the molecular gas, which is an intermediate phase, and that, in very rapid order, uh, goes to form the stars. Okay. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, you know, so basically, uh, uh, hydrogen has uh, a transition which happens to be in the radio. It's a hyperfine transition. I think, given the time, I'll just skip over the slide. And so that's what we observe. Sorry about that. So that's what we observe. Uh, it, it's at a frequency of fourteen twenty megahertz, uh, and if it's at a uh, gas is at a larger redshift, it'll be at a lower frequency or a longer wavelength, and that makes it perfect to observe with the GMRT. Right. So that's how hydrogen in galaxies is measured, atomic hydrogen. The problem is that the atomic hydrogen emission is actually extremely weak, and it's very very difficult to detect beyond the local universe using the telescopes which exist. Uh, um, the largest redshift at which the 21 centimeter emission has currently been detected in emissions about, is about 0 0.036. And, um, uh, you know, the long observations with this telescope, which is one of the places where a lot of time has been devoted into this problem, observations of the order of thousands of hours uh, are what are required to start detecting galaxies, even at redshifts of, zero, of about 0 0.2. I remind you, the things where interesting things happen at begin are at both redshifts of one, right? So you're still not at that, uh, uh, at that distance or that epoch of the galaxy. Right? Of course, uh, things are changing very rapidly. Um, many more galaxies are expected to be detected in this redshift range very shortly via, because there are new telescopes, new instrumentation coming along. And I just put down a bunch of these things which have actually already started taking data uh, and yeah. which have significant sensitivity and you know, will start making uh, 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 headway in this problem. Yeah. What is the resolution of these detectors in the wavelengths that you typically detect? What is the resolution? Yeah, no, that, 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 that takes us very far. The resolution in space or in uh, redshift or- the redshift. Uh, in the in, in redshift, it, um, uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> Uh, uh, for, a, uh, for, 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 for a telescope like the GMRT, we can typically do, you know, of the order of uh, 10 kilometers per second. Now I can reconvert that back into redshift, but it takes me time. I mean, it's a modern coordinators, modern, modern systems, actually, the resolution in redshift is not a problem. Okay. They give you a fantastic resolution in redshift. The resolution in space depends on the configuration of your instrument. So, you know, how far apart your antennas are. Right. Yeah. Is the redshift you measure directly using radio uh, as good as if you were to point a spectroscope at it and, you know, measure? So you oh, yeah. have this resolved in the sky, then you take another telescope, 
jazz is better. Uh, we observe a radio wave uh, and uh, we observe the brightness as a function of frequency. So it is a spectrograph. Yeah, but this is uh, what is typically what is called a spectroscopic redshift by, for example, the optical uh, people. Yeah. Or optical yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, I'm asking, is the precision of that higher than or uh, the precision in the radio? Assume that you have a uh, reasonable signal to noise typically far exceeds precision ex available in optical. But the thing is that the optical people generally have far better signal to noise. I mean, they you know they can observe large number of galaxies compared to what you can do with the H1 because the H1 line is very faint. But in the local universe and things like that, the precision of measurement that you can get with H1 observations far exceeds what you could get with an optical uh, observatory. Yeah. So if I were to look for uh, the redshift drift signal for you, you know, dynamics of cosmology, yeah. uh, that would be much better in the radio than in the optical. But uh, provide, if you have a signal which is bright enough for you to detect. Thanks. All right. So, you know, so all these people, you know, uh, I'm sorry. So all these people have now started uh, beavering away at this problem. And, you know, there'll be stuff coming out pretty soon uh, attacking, uh, you know, this entire redshift range. And so the question we had asked ourselves quite some time ago is what can we do before they start? What can we do early, right, before these people get off the ground? And uh, so that's actually an effort which started quite a long time ago. And uh, it starts basically with this realization that a volume of space that a radio telescope can, can observe at any one instant actually contains thousands of galaxies. It's not that you observe one galaxy and then you turn around and you observe another galaxy and so on. At one shot, you actually typically observe a very, very large number of galaxies. And so even though you may not have the sensitivity to detect any one individual galaxy, surely statistically you would be able to measure um, the, uh, you know, the net content of H1 emission in your field of view. And so the particular th statistics we're going to use are a very simple one. We're going to use stacking. We're going to align all of the spectra together at the same redshift, assuming that we know the position in the sky of the galaxy, we know the redshift of the galaxy, we can align all of their emission lines and we can add them up together. Right? And so that's this basically the rough idea that I have, let's say, three galaxies that I have. Uh, their line comes at different positions. So I don't detect any one of them individually, but I happen to know where that line should come because I know from optical observations what's the red shift of the galaxy. So all I have to do then is to line up these three things so that the emission lines lie one on top of the other and add them up, and then I should be able to make a detection. Right? So, um, so yeah. This assumes that you have enough discreteness. Yes. We have a continuum of objects. Yes. So it will not work. Yes, yes, yes. It but does not happen. It does not happen. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, another way of saying it is, is that you should not be confused. And in certain uh, kinds, if you apply this in certain wavelengths or with certain light spectral lines, you might have a problem with confusion. Over here, confusion is not a problem. <clears throat> Yeah, so, you know, the first proof of concept we had done was quite a long time ago, close to 20 years ago, where we had done, you know, at relatively uh, nearby redshifts, we had done a short integration. And uh, even though none of the individual galaxies were detected, we were actually able to show that uh, we were, um, you know, if you stacked everything together, you could actually see a detection. Uh, of the galaxies. Uh, and, um, you know, there's also certain science which came out of it, which I think in the interest of time, I'll skip over. So um, now let me talk about, again, I think I have just one slide on this, uh, what we've been doing with the old GMRT, and this is work that uh, Philip Law and uh, John Van Rie had done uh, for their PhD theses, uh, working with Frank Briggs uh, in Australia, as well as collaborating with us at the GMRT. And what uh, we did was to try and detect the H1 content of galaxies at intermediate redshifts, redshifts below about 0 0.4. Uh, it was actually quite a hard game to play because it, the old GMRT observed a relatively small volume of the universe at a time. Uh, basically, the bandwidth that we had was only 32 megahertz. And so that meant you, at one, you see a very small chunk of redshift space at a time. And since you are observing a small chunk of redshift space, uh, since uh, massive galaxies are relatively rare, you have to observe a large volume of space before you'll have a reasonable number of massive galaxies. And so if you're going to observe a small volume of space, most of the galaxies you're going to see are actually going to be quite small. They'll have low H1 mass. 
which means your signal will be weak. Right? So all of this led to the fact that you know uh, uh, all these studies ended up with only about rough tentative detections of the stack H1 signal over here. None of them ever quite came up to three sigma. But nonetheless, we, we, because this is a redshift range, which is very hard to probe otherwise, we actually came up with quite competitive uh, constraints on this quantity omega H1, which is the H1 uh, density of the universe as a function of redshift. Uh, and this is what we had got from a, one, a fairly early observation, which was, I think, only about 40 hours. And even in 40 hours with the GMRT, we were already uh, sort of uh, had similar error bars to people to, to the best available measurements at that time. Subsequently, we got uh, somewhat better than that, but I won't spend time on it. Yeah. The y-axis. The y-axis is, so is omega. Uh, so it, it, its units would be, um, uh, in terms of the ratio of the density to the critical density, uh, so there are no units at first. No, here. It's here. multiplied by 10 to, 10 to the minus 3. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, and then uh, Nissim and his collaborators had also sort of uh, done something which was, uh, you know, uh, quite path-breaking, which was to go at a redshift of one. And uh, they selected uh, uh, galaxies from uh, the, the deep two redshift survey, uh, which I'll talk more about later, uh, where they stacked almost a thousand galaxies and they got this very sensitive spectrum, but yet no detection, right? So you, you end up with an upper limit, which again was very competitive, but still an upper limit, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. This looks to me simply like a noise. It is noise. So there's only an upper limit. There's no, there's no signal. There's no signal. This is, this is an upper limit only. Even in the previous case also, I mean, many of them are simply like Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it is noise like, but the, so what we have, you have to look at the, yeah. at that smooth thing at the bottom. Yeah, so here's the This one, yeah. where there is a peak at the right location, but it is not three sigma. It's something like two point something. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you, so you could call it an upper limit also. Yeah. So that's why I said at the best, we are talking about tentative detections with the old system. All right. So these were the limitations we had with the old system that the instantaneous bandwidth was very small. And so, you know, the redshift range that we had the, at one shot, if we were observing, we observed uh, a delta in redshift of only about 0 0.03. And as I said, a single observation covered only a very small volume of space, small number of galaxies to start with. And then again, because you're looking at a small volume of space, most of them are uh, faint, uh, intrinsically faint in the H1. So what would really make a difference to all of this is, is if we could observe a bigger volume of space at one time. And that's exactly what the um, uh, upgraded GMRT did for us. Yeah, thank you. So uh, the upgraded GMRT, I'll just uh, spend two, three slides on it. It's an almost new telescope. So uh, pretty much everything from the front ends, these are the feeds. So basically, at the focus of the antenna, you can put anywhere you you know one of these feeds onto the focus, and that's the thing which picks up the signal for you. And so we have new feeds now, which basically are sensitive to a much wider bandwidth. We have new amplifiers, we have new um, uh, backends, and so on and so forth, and uh, new signal transport system. I won't go into all of the details, but the, the you know the upshot of all of this is that the upgraded GMRT observes a bandwidth of 400 megahertz at a shot. Earlier it was 32, so it's more than a factor of 10, uh, which you have increased in the redshift that you could observe at one go. And I'm just showing that to you again, comparing the old and the new systems. Uh, and this is the fractional bandwidth that you got with any one of our old feed antennas, right? Uh, as a function of uh, uh, the center frequency of that. And the old system is what you see in this gray. It gives you these tiny, tiny bands, uh, fractional bandwidths. The new system gives you this, uh, you know, very, very significant fractional bandwidths. So what I'm going to talk about now is basically surveys using uh, these two what we call band four and band five of the GMRT. Uh, but before I say that, maybe I'll just uh, do one more plug for the upgraded GMRT. This is basically showing you the sensitivity of the upgraded GMRT uh, in some uh, parameter space uh, compared to other radio telescopes uh, that exist around the world. The upgraded GMRT sits around here, these peak points. And the only thing which is better are these uh, stars over there, which is the square kilometer array, which is still to be built. Right, so in many of its frequencies of operation, the upgraded JMRT is uh, one of the best radio telescopes sensitivity-wise in the world. Uh, 
So uh, we used it to do these two uh, redshift uh, surveys in these two redshift ranges, uh, redshift 0 to 0 0.4, which is what we call the band 5 receivers. <clears throat> of course, because you're observing a cone in redshift space, the bulk of the volume is at larger redshift. So the typical redshift of the galaxies we are looking at is closer to 0.3. Um, and the other survey we did was in what we call the band 4 receivers, redshifts of 0 0.74 to 1.45. And they found the PhD thesis of Apurva Bera and Aditya Chaudhary. And um, the observations actually, although we are trying to detect the atomic hydrogen, because we are observing 400 megahertz at a time, you can also measure the, the synchrotron continuum from the galaxies, which we did. And um, that actually is interesting because it allows you, it's another measurement of the star formation rate of the galaxies. The rate at which stars are being formed in the galaxy turns out to be proportional to the continuum radio brightness. And so again, typically we can't detect an individual galaxy in its radio continuum, but we can stack and we can detect the average uh, radio continuum and therefore the average star formation rate in these galaxies. Okay, and we selected uh, this particular uh, set of, uh, uh, you know, sample to follow up with the JMRT. And there were observations fields were chosen from the, the, what's called the D2 redshift survey. And that was for a number of reasons. Uh, the survey area is a reasonable match to the JMRT field of view. That is, um, you know, uh, we, we uh, it surveyed an area which is comparable to what we observe with the JMRT. So it makes for efficient observations. There's quite dense redshift coverage, so we have a good sampling. There's good redshift accuracy, which is important when you stack, because if you don't have good redshift accuracy, the line will get smeared out when you stack. And there's also a lot of multiband photometry available for the galaxy. So we know things like its stellar mass, and we have independent estimates of its star formation rate and so on. Uh, so uh, Deep2 basically did um, had two uh, uh, sort of broke up into two uh, fields, one which was the EGS field, uh, which was the only field in which they actually observed uh, low redshift galaxies. And that's the one which we used for our survey uh, uh, for, for below a redshift of 0 0.4. The remaining fields of the Deep2 survey, they had actually already done a cut before they got the redshifts, before they went out and tried to measure the redshifts of the galaxy. And they had done a cut to get rid of galaxies below about a redshift of 0 0.7. Right? So those fields were not suitable for us for, at, at the lower redshifts, but they were perfectly suited for us at a higher redshift band, band 4 observations. So the rest of the fields we observed with band 4, uh, which is our 0 0.74 to 1.4 uh, redshift survey. All right, uh, so um, this is uh, uh, what Apurva Bera did. Uh, as I said, there were accurate redshifts uh, available for Keck. Uh, in this uh, regime, it was actually often better than 30 kilometers per second. And um, you know, you know, now, uh, because we have uh, this large bandwidth, he had a factor of five larger samples uh, than what we had observed earlier with the, with the GMRT. So it was all good stuff. The only uh, slightly irritating thing was that the EGS is actually this long thin strip over here and uh, the um, GMRT field of view is that. So our, our observing wasn't that efficient. There are large regions of space where there were galaxies, but we couldn't send it into our analysis because we don't know the redshift. But, uh, sorry. Yeah. Ah, sorry. Yeah. It jumps. it jumps very, it's uh, extraordinarily sensitive. It either doesn't jump or it jumps. <laughs> several. And now it's not working. How do we go? All right. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll go there. It's actually frustrating. All right. Yeah, so um, so this is what he did. He uh, observed this field and he stacked um, uh, the, the galaxies that he had in his sample. And as I told you, the median redshift actually turns out to be towards the higher end of that uh, band. It turns out about a redshift of 0 0.34. 
And uh, so this is the stacked spectrum that we got, um, and it's a seven sigma detection. Now it's the first uh, statistical measurement of the H1 content of star forming galaxies above a redshift of 0 0.2. And so one of the first things he was able to show was that these galaxies are actually much more gas rich, about two times more gas rich than comparable Z is equal to zero galaxies. So as you go up, even to a redshift of only 0 0.34, uh, the, the content of the galaxies is already beginning to change quite dramatically. There's much more gas uh, in these galaxies, even by the time you get to a redshift of about 0.34. So there's, um, as I said, you get uh, continuum, radio continuum measurements uh, for free in a sense. I mean, you have to analyze the data, of course, which is quite challenging, but Abur Barbera is really pretty much of a black belt in all of this. And so he produced this image, which has a sensitivity of about 0 0.25 microjans per beam, which is really one of the most sensitive uh, and deepest images of this field at this frequency. And you make the very clear detection of the stacked radio emission uh, from uh, the galaxy. So he stacked all of the uh, galaxies in space. And uh, that's the detection of the stack emission. So there's no doubt over there. And you get uh, a measurement of the star formation rate. And since you know the amount of atomic gas there is, you know the star formation rate, you can compute the gas depletion time, which is just the ratio of the two, which turns out to be nine giga years. Right, so it, uh, they've got a lot more gas, but its depletion time as far as atomic hydrogen is concerned is similar to that in the local universe. This is measured from the stacked data? Yes. So it is like the average of all the- It's the average of all the stacked data. But like the shape and profiles of all of these galaxies probably very different. Yes, uh, that, uh, but at our um, uh, uh, angular resolution, they are not resolved. They're typically point sources. So what you're seeing literally is the instrument profile. Thanks. Yeah, so, um, uh, so, so I, I'm going to leave you with this. There's more stuff uh, which is uh, uh, being submitted for, uh, 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 you know, which is going through the review process and so on and scaling relations on, on the H1 mass function and so on and so forth, which will come out shortly. But what I'd like to do is to, yeah. Yeah. The earlier depletion time was from molecular hydrogen? Yes, yes. And this nine giga years is the depletion time for atomic hydrogen in the local universe. And they have different depletion times. Uh, this was at uh, Z of 0 0.4. So. This was at Z of 0.4. And actually a few giga years is what you get even at Z is equal to zero. So these galaxies are much more massive, but they have similar depletion time because the star formation rate at that epoch is also slightly higher. So they have more gas, but the forming stars a bit faster and it all balances out. Sorry. No, that's okay. okay. Yeah. The depletion rate of the atomic and molecular are very, are very different typically. Uh, over here, at Z is equal to zero or even Z is equal to 3.4. The, the molecular gas seems to have depletion times of about a giga year or slightly smaller, regardless of redshift. Then they evolve, then they appear to evolve much with redshift. So, uh, so that I'll just move on to uh, work at redshift of one, uh, which uh, again, um, uh, I'll just remind you, it's for uh, redshifts typically between 0 0.74 and 1.45. And, the, uh, and this was part of the deep two strategy that they had multiple fields spread over the sky so that they could observe uh, throughout the year. And that works for us too. That allows us to observe at nighttime, which is when the interference is less. Uh, and uh, so we, 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 we spent quite a lot of time uh, following up on all of these fields. I'll show you first uh, the result from a, a pilot survey, which is just about 90 hours uh, of, of data. Uh, and uh, I'll show you later work which came with a follow-up survey with about 510 hours of data. So this is uh, what came out of 90 hours of data. Uh, it's um, uh, of the 90 hours, only 60 is actually pointing at the source. The remaining 30 goes in calibrations of various kinds. They stacked almost uh, 7,500 galaxies, which is an order of magnitude more than what NISM had managed at the same redshift earlier. And you get a very, very clear uh, detection uh, of the H1 emission. So this is the first time we're actually able to probe out to an epoch which is interesting because this is the point at which, you know, the star formation rate and so on and so forth is beginning to show quite strong evolution. Yeah, this is band four. And that is just, uh, again, with just 90 hours of data uh, showing you that the uh, emissions also localized uh, uh, exactly where you would expect it to be localized. Uh, 
It's localized in space and redshift. Uh, yeah. So no, no. Uh, you know, I mean, are you like collecting it from 60 hours? Or yeah. Before? Yeah. Since we are rotating, uh, I mean, the, is it some directionality restriction you have or detection like you can? Yeah, so so 60 hours would not be collected at one go because, um, you know, the source rises and sets and so you can see it maximum by for 12 hours is the maximum you could track it at one go. So, yeah. so there's multiple observations spread over months and years which have got averaged together. So yeah. At a particular time of a day or something like that? It doesn't matter. Uh, the time of day doesn't matter because, um, uh, I mean, the sky rotates in uh, funny ways yeah. because of the Earth's axis, rotation axis, and all that, but that's all deterministic. Yeah. You know, all of that can be simply taken out. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It is also, this yeah. antenna that's progressing, it's yeah, yeah. continuously changing. Yeah, so all that is, uh, you know, calculable and taken out. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> So these yeah. numbers that you're now reporting are the first time people have actually quantified these. Yes, 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 yes. So it will be, you know, it was a, a publication in Nature because the first time anybody has ever gone out uh, to that redshift. All right, so now let me just show you a few things that you learn, and this is from our deeper survey. Um, so first, let's ask the question, you know, I said that the bulk of the baryonic matter is in stars, H1 and H2. This is where uh, you have dark matter, and then you have the baryonic matter, and the baryonic matter is typically in one of these three things, the stars, the atomic hydrogen, and the molecular hydrogen. So you can ask the question, how does this, you know, how does the division between these evolve with time? Right. And there is a sample which all of these questions can be answered. Uh, for the deep two sample, the stellar masses and star formation rates are available from SCD fitting as, and the radio continuum images respectively. The molecular mass we can estimate uh, because the people have given us a fitting formula. You know, for example, as I said, the, this depletion time doesn't vary very much with redshift and varies a little bit for which people give you a fitting formula. And so from that fitting formula, you can estimate how much molecular gas there is. And the H1 mass comes from our observations. So uh, I'll that's what's being shown over here. It's the ratio of uh, the mass of whatever species, uh, the H1, the H2, or uh, the molecular uh, H1, H2, or the stars uh, to the total baryonic mass, right? And so it all add up finally to, to, to 100%. So uh, the molecular gas is what's shown in this blue over here. Uh, this is what happens to the molecular gas between redshifts of about 1.3 and the local redshift. What you see for the stars is this, that the stars actually go from being about, uh, you know, less than 20% of the mass uh, at redshifts of 1.3 to being dominant at low redshift. 60% of the baryonic mass of galaxies at low redshift is uh, formed of stars. And the atomic hydrogen does something even more dramatic. It's totally dominant at high redshifts. Galaxies are really predominantly, the baryonic matter is predominantly atomic hydrogen. You, you, you can see it's almost close to 80% of the mass, the baryonic mass of a galaxy at these redshifts is, is, is atomic hydrogen. And it, it falls down to about, uh, you know, a little over 30% by the time you get to, uh, to, to local redshifts. So it's, it's already beginning to tell you, you know, what's happening to the baryons in galaxies as time goes on. And I'll say more about it uh, as we go along. I mean, uh, the, these were the things which were first established because molecular gas observations had happened quite a long time ago. That uh, at these redshifts, uh, the atomic, uh, the molecular gas, and the stellar mass were comparable, and that's something that people have known for a few years. And it actually, uh, you know, these are other observations that led to the speculations that galaxies at these redshift have predominantly molecular gas. That that's basically what's there. There's molecular gas and it gets converted into stars. But we are able to convincingly show that actually the molecular gas is the tip of the iceberg. The bulk of the galaxy is actually atomic gas. Uh, is there yeah. Extend up to the redshift of two when the, the star formation peaks? We don't have measurements at redshift of two. <laughs> this is the highest redshift that we film. No. Yeah. These are the highest redshifts at which any observations of uh, of uh, atomic hydrogen are available. Peak happens. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, molecular mass, molecular mass, peak, uh, like, the, like the star formation rate between the trips of one to three. Mass and stars and. Yeah, it will be comparable. I think I don't remember what the stellar mass is at redshift of three. It's probably that the molecular gas probably it will the stellar mass presumably will be smaller, and so the molecular gas will be still higher. Yeah, sorry. Yes. This uh, molecular mass is from uh, CO. Um, no, it's from this fitting formula, which is which is in turn based on both CO and dust measurements. Okay, so my question was: yeah. Is there any uh, difference if one uses C plus, like? Uh, 
Um, I don't know, you know, how large a sample of galaxies it's available for, and so, you know, whether one has measurements. So this literally is a form of fitting formula, which has used thousands of galaxies, uh, CO and dust measurements, et cetera, to try and... Yes, uh, it be have much fewer galaxies here. One more question. Now. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. So uh, I listened for the atomic gas, yeah. you were averaging over a few redshifts, right? So yes. what is that uh, compared to the... So, uh, so I'll show you in a moment. So we, it's in two redshift bins. So between 0.7 and 1.4, we've broken it up into two redshift bins. And we've done the same for everything. Yeah. One, yes. Whatever. Yeah, that point at 1.3. Yeah. 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 I'll show you the bins, I think, in a later slide. Yeah, okay. So we can also measure the H1 depletion times because uh, we know the star formation rate. And, um, you know, as uh, because we have uh, 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 much deeper observations now, we can split the uh, sample into subsamples like we did in the previous slide. So I'm showing you here uh, the H1 depletion time on the vertical axis versus stellar mass. So you've divided the galaxy sample into two stellar mass bins and you've uh, sort of measured the depletion time uh, for galaxies of these uh, characteristic stellar masses. And uh, what's shown, that's our measurements are here in the red, uh, showing you what's the depletion time at redshifts of about one. And uh, these two points at the top are basically measurements uh, from the Z is equal to zero. So they're asking the question, similar galaxies at the local universe, what is their depletion time? How does it compare to the depletion time uh, at redshifts of about one? And so what we find is that there's a huge change in the depletion time. The depletion time is almost an order of magnitude more. Uh, 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 at lower redshifts, it's a, it's an order of magnitude smaller at high redshifts. So even though these galaxies have a huge amount of new, uh, neutral hydrogen, they are consuming gas into stars at a very very rapid rate, right? Uh, so uh, they, that's basically what the depletion time is telling you that the star formation rate has gone up so much that the gas actually will get consumed very rapidly. The gas will actually get consumed at time scales of the order of a giga year, and the giga year, in fact, is um, uh, uh, is uh, roughly the uh, uh, sort of time difference between these two redshift intervals, which we probe, and I'll get back into that in a moment. But the thing I'd like to point out now is that the redshift, uh, the depletion times are very short. It's of the order of a giga year. And, uh, you know, for galaxies, for example, which have solar mass, mass greater than about 10 to the 10 solar masses. And that's actually an interesting cut because here, uh, what, what I'm showing you is uh, the star formation rate density as a function of galaxy mass. Um, you know, the star formation rate density, solar masses per year per megaparsec cubed. So this is the average star formation rate density in the universe. You're asking the question, how much do galaxies of different mass contribute to the star formation rate, right? And you can see that the bulk of the contribution and in fact, the bulk of the change between the star formation rates between these two redshift bins that we see is over here. The low mass galaxies actually are pretty much producing the same amount of stars per unit time uh, 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 at these two redshift intervals, but at high redshifts, actually, the, the, you know, the high mass galaxies are producing stars at a very different rate. So much of the evolution that you're seeing in that cosmic rate density is coming from these galaxies, these galaxies with redshifts greater than 10 to the 10, right? And those are the ones which have extremely short depletion times. And so these are the two redshift bins that we took. And, you know, here's that plot again of the cosmic star formation rate as a function of redshift. And uh, so, you know, you split the sample two in two in redshift now, and you can study, you know, uh, one sample which is close to the peak, uh, you know, that broad peak uh, of the star formation rate, and one which is from the, in the area where it's beginning to decline. Right, and when you do this, we sort of, that's a nuisance parameter of the stellar mass, but we normalize things to keep the stellar mass uh, similar to, to masses of the order of 10 to the 10 solar masses. And the look back time between these two bins is actually all comparable to the H1 depletion time uh, of the galaxies. So there's about one giga year between these two bins that we are talking about. And what we find is that the average H1 mass of the galaxies in this bin and this bin actually declines very sharply by a factor of three, right? So what it means is that the gas over here is getting consumed by star formation, it's not getting replaced. 
So that accretion uh, or hierarchical merger or whatever it was, which was adding more mass to the galaxy is not, is beginning to tail off over here, right? This is the point at which you are not accreting gas sufficiently fast for you to go on building galaxies at that rapid clip. Right, so what? So that's basically the takeaway that we have: that insufficient gas uh, accretion is what is causing the decline in the star formation rate. All right, so that I think brings me finally to my summary. Um, you know, we uh, make robust detections now uh, of the average gas content of galaxies at redshifts between 0.4 and 1.4, and that's thanks to the capabilities of the upgraded GMRT, and of course, thanks to these fabulous graduate students that we have and Nisim Kanekar. Uh, our surveys have established that galaxies at intermediate redshift are much more H1 rich than Z is equal to zero. H1 dominates the baryonic mass. In fact, it's not just that they are much more gas rich. Uh, by the time you reach a redshift of 1.3, H1 is the dominant component. And even though they are so gas rich, the depletion times are very short because the star formation rate is very rapid. And, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the, if you compare uh, what uh, the gas content is of galaxies at a redshift of 1.3 and slightly below 1, you can see that what's happening over there is that the gas accretion is, uh, is insufficient to maintain that star formation rate. And so, therefore, it's insufficient gas accretion that's, that's driving the decline in the star formation rate. And yeah, there's you know lots more stuff coming out as you can imagine. Uh, we are still picking data, and there's a lot more uh, stuff even with this data, which is still in the pipeline. Right, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Engaged. So, Alok, could you unmute yourself and ask the question? Alok Ray? Uh, yeah, but my connection is very poor. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so, I had typed the question, but maybe uh, I can still ask the question. Yeah, yeah, please, please ask the question. We can hear you. Uh, in the, uh, the ABJ letter paper that you showed, um, there was a a different variation um, beyond Z equal to Z of one between the molecular gas variation with Z and atomic, and atomic gas uh, with um, redshift. Is this uh, also connected with uh, the gas depletion time scale difference or what is it due to? Um, uh, 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 yeah, I mean, uh, I guess the question is that the atomic gas content and the molecular gas content don't seem to be following the same pattern. That is, the ratio of molecular gas to atomic gas is evolving with time. Is that uh, basically what your question is? I just want to make Sorry, sure I you understood it. Much of your reformulation. Uh, my, my question is, beyond Z equal to 1, the red curve and the blue curve have opposite um, variation um, slopes. Yes. So is, is that connected with the depletion times or what is it due to? Um, well, uh, so what would drive those curves is a, a balance between the rate at which uh, gas is being accreted into the galaxy, not a balance. What determines the shape of the curves is the rate at which gas is accreted into the galaxy and the rate at which stars uh, gas is converted into stars. Um, uh, and um, so presumably there's something different happening over there. So maybe related to the fact, as I was saying, at some point the uh, gas accretion actually stops. Uh, at that very rapid uh, rate, which is uh, driving that very uh, large star formation rate at uh, redshifts one to three. Between below about a redshift of one, actually what we find uh, is that um, the gas accretion, uh, uh, the whole thing is actually more or less in a steady state. The gas accretion more or less keeps up with the star formation rate. Whereas here, um, so it is related to the depletion time, I guess. Uh, whereas over here, the gas is actually depleting very rapidly. Uh, uh, the accretion is not keeping up with the rate at which it's getting converted to stars. That's beyond yeah. Z equal to one. Yeah. Oh. yeah. 
Okay, this is saying the odds are equal to one. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. 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 Uh, Whenever you like, but since yeah. Jaram raised it, I was yeah. going to ask why yeah. is the ratio between molecular and atomic? Yeah, yeah. It's it's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, pre it. Yeah, I don't know the answer in detail, uh, but um, uh, 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 perhaps part of it is driven with the fact that um, uh, I mean. Yeah, no, I don't know the answer in detail. Let me not conjecture. <laughs> yeah, on, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. what I was uh, this gas equation that you are talking about is yeah. because of the some of the stars are dying. Or... To what I was showing right at the beginning, uh, as I said, um, you know, the galaxies are not like static objects. Um, you know, you they they are growing objects. Um, and so there are these two ways in which they can get gas. Uh, there are two ways in which they, I mean, multiple ways in which they grow. I mean, things merge to form, smaller galaxies merge to form bigger galaxies. In so this is basically dark matter merging and carrying the baryons along with them. In addition, the baryons themselves can accrete onto all, uh, already existing dark matter halos. They can accrete either, uh, you know, violently by forming shocks and a hot corona which cools down and uh, goes in. Or they can accrete by having cool filaments of gas along which flow uh, through the dark matter halo and reach the center of the galaxies. So it's this accretion that I'm, we are talking about. Okay, so what uh, yeah. I, I just was curious to know about yeah. when you said that uh, uh, the star formation rate each time probably yeah. is reducing because of. Uh, uh, I think the depletion of gas. That's not so, yeah. so. What we're basically saying there's no so that's it here. Yeah. At the same time, yeah. in the galaxy, some of the stars also are dying. Are. Are. So there is a so there is a cycle between um, between uh, matter and stars and matter and gas. Uh, you know, uh, so there, there is definitely that cycle going on. But uh, you know, typically it goes on at a steady clip. Um, but you know, as you can, uh, so what? That's not what's happening over here at the peak of star formation. It's not this, you know. It's not like a closed box where there's some just uh, the, you know the gas going back and forth between. Not quite. I mean, yeah, going going to stars and bulk of it coming back and then forming more stars again or whatever. And in fact, even if you look at it, at these low red shifts, it turns out that uh, closed box models typically don't work. There is return of material into the interstellar medium, but typically you will need some inflow of material to continue to feed galaxies. Yeah. But is it, yeah. I mean, does it say that, um, like, for example, I was thinking like if you have a matter a distributed uh, mass and so on, so eventually it will turn up that you have small, small, I mean, uh, stars and so on, and the matter, uh, this distribution is gone completely. Is that the way you are thinking? I mean, that's the way it's going. Um, like you have this gas, which actually has formed the stars. Yes. So it means that you essentially have yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so the distribution of yeah. that, that happens. That, you know. Yeah. So you have a like, gas cloud which collapses from stars. Well, usually the energy that the stars bump back into the interstellar medium will disrupt this cloud at some point or the other. And then it will form again and so on and so forth. So this cycle goes on happening. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, it may be driven by things like the spiral arm in our galaxy. As the spiral arm goes through, it it will actually shock and compress gas, and that will cool fragment form stars. All these sort of things go on. But here we're asking a, a big picture question: that how much matter is there, and you know, how does it relate to how much stars are forming? And so, uh, here certainly you're going to need material to fall into the galaxies to sustain that star formation rate. And even at low red shifts, uh, you do need some amount of material to continue to accrete into the galaxy to sustain the star formation rates. Okay. Uh, Jaram, yeah. has it at all been possible to measure the clustering in your 500 hour data? Well, I mean, we are based on our optical red shift sample, no? So the clustering is known from the optical sample. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but uh, what we could ask is how does the H1 content depend on the clustering, which is exactly. <laughs> which is in the pipeline. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. I was thinking yeah. about how your signal sensitivity yeah. depends on your redshift. So if you have a certain angular resolution, if I think of a cone, yeah. that means your 1 over R square is uh, balanced out by the area you are going to look at. Yes. So you have yeah. a sort of equal 
amount of signal coming from any redshift if the density is the same. No, there's also the, because of the redshift, there's also a further dimming of galaxies, etc. So it actually is harder at a larger redshift. It's not, it's not. No, no. Yeah, yeah. It, it helps, but uh, it is harder at higher high rates. Yeah. Okay. Sushi? Yeah. So, along with the red shifts, are you also sensitive to line broadening of 21 centimeters? Uh, see, because uh, we, uh, we uh, may be sensitive to line broadening, and it depends on the accuracy with which you are able to do the stacking, because there will be some line broadening because you weren't able to align the galaxies properly together, right? Because if you didn't know exactly where they were in redshift space, you will smear out the signal. Oh, okay, so, right. I, so, so it's like an, you know, that's like an instrumental broadening. Yeah, but, yeah. I may have not correctly said line yeah. broadening, which could imply thermal effects or differential expansion effects, anything like that. Um, so the, the line widths that we are talking about are far larger than the thermal line width of the line. Uh, it's driven by the kinematics of the object. Okay. And so, um, you know, and again, that's one of the things we are looking to see, whether we can actually start making statements about the kinematics uh, of subsamples. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Is there any information known about H minus in this region and in this uh, ranges? Because that <laughs> no, yeah. the, uh, I don't think H minus is detected in our galaxy itself. I could be wrong, but yeah, it is. No, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so, a question uh, yeah. up here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have a question regarding did you try uh, using, uh, say, the metallicity lines and like starting with those? You see, do you see the particular? So the, the, the redshifts are measured from uh, from metal lines here. The yeah, yeah, yeah. The H alpha line or whatever is the, yeah, yeah, not the ones you look at here. Yeah. Thank you, Shubhadeep. Yeah. Um, uh, any other question? Yes, yes, look at that. Uh, yeah. I don't know whether you might have already explained this. Hydrogen line and the star. These two lines are completely opposite. I mean, is this explained in the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, yeah, I think that was what uh, okay. both, uh, okay. both uh, Sandeep and Alok were, okay. were grilling on. Yes, I, it was interesting, uh, but I, at this moment, we did not want to speculate on why. Okay. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Sandeep. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for a really fantastic yeah. talk. And, you know, that transparency which shows uh, upgraded GMRT versus yeah. SK yeah. brings pride to anyone in TIPAR's heart. But since you will have a clear lead over the world for many years to come, how far out in Z will you be? Okay, so we are doing 2.3 at the moment. So uh, we've already started 2.3 and let's see where we get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that really goes to the peak of this. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So we'll see. <laughs> 200 hours. Yeah, yeah. Approaching a thousand is what we'll need if the tack will give it to us. Goku left, right? <laughs> <laughs> he strategically left before I could say that. Well, okay. well, if there are any questions for the Zoom audience yes. also, then we will conclude the colloquium. Yes. And yes. Jenna, one second. Just taking the power of GMRT. I can speak. So, thank you. I thank all of you for joining through Zoom as well. And let's have a little bit of snacks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, here is the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah.